hope you get cursed for all eternity! Already been done, kid. Already done. Konami in 2012. That's it, that's the joke. Okay, but no, seriously, I doubt I have to explain much, as Konami's been meme to hell and back at this point. Probably rightfully so. But critically speaking, 2012 was a really rough year for Konami. For starters, this was the year they did some nigh irreparable damage to the Silent Hill franchise. While I will admit that I didn't personally hate Silent Hill Downpour, I will say that judging by the game's rather polarizing reception, it wasn't quite the return to form that many fans have been waiting years on end for since the disbanding of Team Silent. And that's really not so bad, but that same year, hell, that same month even, Konami would also outsource the HD remasters of Silent Hill 2 and 3 to a third-party developer, which ended up being a glitch-ridden mess due to said remasters being based off of incomplete source code. And finally, they'd commission yet another third-party developer to make a PS Vita-exclusive dungeon-crawling RPG based on the series. I haven't played Silent Hill Book of Memories either because I don't have a PS Vita, but the reception to this one was also... pretty mixed. Now, what I'm about to say isn't meant to be taken seriously, but I like to think that Konami's awkward E3 press conference in 2010 marked the beginning of the end for the company. Or rather, the company's good graces in the eyes of many gamers. But there was a game announced at this press conference, and it's something that's always exciting to see from a major publisher. A brand new IP. Something that's become increasingly rare as console generations marched on. And that game was never dead. The brainchild of frequent Metal Gear series game designer Shinta Nojiri, Never Dead is a third-person shooter released in early 2012 for the Xbox 360 and PlayStation 3. Though despite it coming from the mind at somebody at the Japanese company, it was actually developed by English company Rebellion, the creators of the Sniper Elite series and the 2009 kinda sorta Richard Marcinko autobiography Rogue Warrior. So while it plays like a Western-made game, it has the skin of a Japanese game on top of it. I will admit I was kinda interested in playing this when it was first announced, but I got pretty dissuaded from it after seeing initial reception be pretty... harsh. The PS3 version, which is the version you'll be seeing footage of, has an average Metacritic score of 50. But now that I finally checked it out, is it as bad as everyone says it is? Well, let me tell you what I think of it anyway. You play as Bryce Boltzmann, Demon Slayer for Hire. 500 years before the start of the game, Bryce is cursed by the Demon Lord Astaroth with the curse of immortality. And the curse of a really fugly facial scar. Fast forward 500 years to the present day, and Bryce is a bit of a drunken burnout who hunts demons just to pay rent. And lucky for him, hunting demons is a profitable business in the world this game's set in, because he's under the employ of the National Anti-Demon Agency. He's often accompanied by fellow Nada agent, Arcadia, who, depending on your tolerance for mouthy women, can either be a character you like, or downright hate, as she's seen outright abusing Bryce at times. It's business as usual until the team is tasked with dealing with a demon outbreak at the local museum, where they happen across Nikki Summerfield, a pop starlet who, as was the case with Arcadia, you'll either love or you'll find annoying. Do you have any clue who I am? I'm Nikki Summerfield, you moron. Yeah, the Nikki Summerfield. But I guess I can't blame you. My big team you are some serious squirrel bait. Me, personally, I find the fact that she's voiced by Laura Bailey makes her much more bearable, though I could see her being unbearable to others, as she is a bit of a brat at times. In fact, one of the game's strongest aspects is actually its voice cast. David Lodge plays Bryce as a jaded old man who's completely over this shit and clearly just in it for a paycheck, and I think he does a great job with it. Yeah, riveting. So getting back to what I was saying, when the hell am I gonna get paid? Michelle Ruff is also pretty fantastic as Arcadia. Hell no! Your blood's not going anywhere near my wound! And Alex just wouldn't sound so menacing if he weren't voiced by Liam O'Brien. Tough break. He was hit by a stray knife I threw. Purely unintentional, you know. 
The only thing about the voice acting is that Bryce will repeat himself a lot during gameplay, especially during sections where you're exploring areas with just his severed head. Hope this doesn't mess up my hair. Get your head in the game, Bryce. Get your head in the game, Bryce. Hope this doesn't mess up my hair. Pretty much any time he's missing one of his limbs, he will not shut up about it. Since Bryce is immortal, he has a unique skill that allows him to survive his limbs being detached. One of the first things you'll see is, as you take damage from enemies, you may notice an arm or a leg will fly off, but you'll still live. You can reclaim your limbs to keep going as normal, or detach them to solve environmental puzzles. You can also electrocute yourself or set yourself on fire to solve puzzles or add additional damage to your weapons, once you've unlocked the ability to do so. You gain experience points from taking out enemies, completing missions, and by finding red angel wings scattered all over levels. And experience unlocks skills that can be equipped and swapped out at any time in the select menu, such as stronger gun or sword attacks, or faster movement while decapitated, just to name a few. When you're not doing that, you have your standard pistols, SMGs, assault rifle, shotgun, and eventually a grenade launcher. Two arms means that two weapons can be wielded simultaneously, and you'll be doing plenty of shooting. And this is kind of where the game's problems start to arise. First off, the game's camera is a bit on the sluggish side, I find. No matter how high I turned up the sensitivity, there's like this half a second where the camera starts turning really slowly before it decides it wants to speed up. It's a bit hard to describe, but it left me wishing that the camera speed was just one consistent speed throughout. It makes aiming shots awkward. You can also zoom in to get a better aim at enemies, but until you unlock the aim assist, I didn't find it that much more helpful. You also get to use Bryce's sword, only instead of using it with buttons like you think you would, you need to lock on enemies or environmental objects like chains and levers with the L1 button, and swing the right stick left and right or up and down in order to attack with it. This has got to be the clunkiest damn sword I've ever used in a video game. Yeah, Devil May Cry, this is not. And certain enemies can only be damaged with it. As I've stated before, losing limbs won't kill you, but you will lose some abilities, like using the weapon equipped to your lost hand, or the ability to run if you lose both of your legs. Except for when the grandbaby enemies are around. These little tiny demon enemies will eat your detached limbs, including your head, when they fall off for whatever reason. While you can't die in this game, you can, however, fail the mission and be sent back to a checkpoint. And it's a mission failed if the grandbabies eat your head and you fail the QTE to get out. The QTE has a half a second delay, so I failed it quite often, especially early on. And the grandbabies are everywhere, all the time, so you're in constant danger of them swallowing your head. They alone make boss encounters or sections with respawning enemies incredibly frustrating. Yes, I said respawning enemies. Several sections of levels will wall you off from progress until you've taken out enemy spawners, and then every enemy in the area. And it gets really annoying when you have one last little creature hiding somewhere, or one that runs away really fast. The fact that the game reuses this a lot to pad out the game adds to its repetitiveness. And the spawners themselves are one of those enemies that can only be killed with the sword. Special mention goes to the game's second boss fight, where you have to throw one of your arms into its mouth to let it suck it in. You then have to fire your gun with the swallowed hand to reveal its weak point on the outside. This would be a clever boss fight, but it got super frustrating for me. You can't get too close to it because A, it'll launch debris at you, and B, it expels a poisonous gas that inverts your controls temporarily. I wouldn't be surprised if people rage quit the game just because of this boss fight. Lord knows I almost did. This is annoying. Speaking of debris, one thing I had no idea that this game has was destructible environments. Not only is it a really nice attention to detail, but the game actually incorporates that into both combat and exploration. Shoot a pillar, for example, and it'll fall and crush an enemy. 
Nearly everything in a stage can be destroyed and debris will pile up in levels. And while that is, again, a nice touch, the debris can also hinder your movement if you're not careful. Not to mention all of the debris flying at once can come at the cost of the frame rate. More on that in a moment. I'd like to quickly go over the presentation. I do find the art style appealing. It has that Japanese video game aesthetic, you know the one, despite the game itself being developed by an English company. And I do find the pre-rendered cutscenes very nice, very well animated and with a clean art direction. Now obviously a 7th generation console game, much less a multi-platform one, isn't going to look quite as good in action, but the stage designs still look decent, even remarkable at times. So it's just such a shame that the presentation is kneecapped pretty hard by the engine the game is running on. And I'm sure one or two of you watching this that know of this game were probably waiting for me to talk about the game's performance. As was the case with many multi-platform games made by third-party developers during the seventh console generation, the game runs on the town bicycle that is Unreal Engine 3. And as a result, the game, or the PS3 version of it anyway, runs on a maximum 720p and is capped at 30 frames per second. Other Unreal 3 hallmarks, including ugly shadows and texture pop-in, also make an appearance. And the screen tears as bad as an old sock. And so constantly, too. I may not remember a whole lot of PS3 era games too well, because was screen tear always this bad back then? I mentioned how I almost rage quit the game as early as the second boss, and truth be told, even before that, I was getting pretty frustrated by the controls, the camera, even the general gameplay. The shooting controls just felt stiff, and the game's over-reliance on taking out enemy spawners got old quick. Not to mention failing the quick time event to get your head out of the grand baby enemies. It all just added up to a very irritating experience. This is annoying. It wasn't until well over halfway through the game before it all finally started to click with me. I got used to the controls, knew to expect the enemy spawners, knew what enemy was weak to what kind of weapon, and knew to switch out my skills for other ones. The game was still very repetitive at that point, and it'll still trap you in rooms that you can't leave until you clear out all the enemies. But I grew to just kind of accept it, and I found myself clearing these rooms with relative ease. That is right until the last two boss fights, where you have to not only fight them a super specific way to actually damage them, but also avoid attacks that can blow all your limbs off. The final boss has an attack that can separate you from all of your limbs in a matter of seconds. And yes, those annoying grandbabies are everywhere during those fights. Just as the game was finally starting to get its act together, it throws some aggravating crap at you at the zero hour, and for me anyway, sealed its fate. What happened here? I went into this game cautiously optimistic, and it came out the other end just frustrated and empty. I'm someone who usually tries to look for the good in every game he plays, and yeah, the presentation is fairly solid and the story is decent enough. Hell, even the demon designs are pretty sweet. I didn't even mind that they would often reuse them. But these are all things that you can experience without even having to put the disc into your system. The controls feel unresponsive, the performance is subpar at best, the game's main gimmick is more annoying in execution than it is clever, and the most satisfaction I got out of actually finishing this game, aside from making this video, is knowing that I'll never have to play this again. But at least it's mercifully short. On normal, it'll take you about 6 or 7 hours to get to the end, and if you're anything like me, you'll be super out of breath when you finally cross that finish line. I can't say I ever see myself playing this again, and if you haven't played it for yourself, I suggest you don't either. If you find yourself at least a little curious about it, just watch a playthrough of it on YouTube instead. It'll be a much less frustrating experience for you. And that's the word I would use to describe Never Dead as a whole. It's a frustrating game. Not just because of the gameplay, but because this could have been a lot more. 
I guess for being the first outright negative review for this channel, you'd think I would have gone in a lot harder on it. And yeah, the game is definitely too flawed for me to recommend. But more than anything, I'm just disappointed. I went in with tempered expectations and I was still let down. But really, I can say I'm glad I finally gave it a try. I just don't think I want to play it again is all. Oh, almost forgot to mention, this game had multiplayer, because of course it did. <laughs> 